Gary's back to back. Yeah, I mean, I think there is this interesting uh, um, uh, transformation because when we talk about social media, it's basically you know expressing our views and our from our brain and, and what we write. And then you know, in the talk we heard about the manipulation and using that coming back at us and start to actually uh, manipulate what we think and do. Um, and so I think going into these uh, sensors and, and devices that we're now having uh, associated with our body is sort of the next step of that. It's not just what we think and write, but now it's how we feel our body does and, and acts and where it is and so on. Um, and right now we're sort of at that first stage like social media where we're using that to uh, collect data about ourselves. But it's not inconceivable to think at some point it'll be then used to control us too, just like the social media is now used, being used to manipulate us politically in other ways. Um, to be able to use these devices to control us in various ways and, and manipulate our behavior. And, and already people have scenarios about that. So I have to say, Katina has sort of been the leader in this area. She, I've been followed her for long before I ever met her. Uh, someone who's been looking at these issues for many years. And we have all these devices that are now um, I don't know, that, uh, available that are, that are here now. And you know we can only begin to think about what's coming in the future because there's so much energy and resources going into this. And these are devices, uh, sensors that are either on the outside of our body using some kind of wearable, or could be implanted inside our body, which is even more sort of permanent and, and, and uh, difficult to do. And the, the driver for this right now is health uh, uh, devices. Uh, and it, it, there's a lot of sense to that because you, know, you don't really get a realistic sense of someone's health by looking at them at a doctor's appointment 15 minutes every year. That's just a little snapshot in the doctor's office. You're not really understanding what that person's doing, what's happening with their health. If you can now monitor it 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, in all the actual environments that person lives and, 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 and operates in, you're going to get a much more comprehensive view of what their health is. Uh, but you're also getting a lot of data, and the whole issue of data versus information and knowledge is going to be a huge one in that. Uh, but that's one where there's a tremendous amount of effort going into. Not a lot of necessarily benefits yet, but you can see it probably coming. Um, uh, and there is also a, a better regulatory legal response, at least you know, in the United States, because we do have laws for health data. But what's interesting is these are now also being used for non-medical areas, and so that's what I wanted to focus on, for monitoring a lot of different other types of things other than your health. Identity, location, activity, wellness, performance, status, environmental monitoring. Uh, I'm working on a project now where we're, we're looking at uh, how companies can monitor your exposure to chemicals in the workplace much more accurately than they ever could before. Or air pollutants, right? In, in, in most cities, you have 20 or 30 sensors that are measuring air pollutants at these stationary sources that don't get at all a comprehensive uh, picture of what's happening in terms of local exposures. And, and as we now allow people to carry these little sensors and detect themselves, we're seeing why is a kid walking home from school next to a highway having these asthma attacks? Because it turns out there's these you know, local concentrations at much higher levels there than, than, our, than our monitors that are you know, in other places are measuring. And so we're getting, again, this much more comprehensive picture of what's actually going on to allow us to understand what's going on and to intervene. Um, but so as a lawyer, um, lawyers always look at the dark side of things. We look mm -hmm. at problems. We look at risks. That's why companies hate us. The in-house counsel is always hated. My wife's an in-house counsel, a large company. You know, when she shows up at a meeting, everyone goes, you know, go away. Because she's there to tell you the risks, to tell you the problems. And, you know, I think a lot of these sensors are going to have a lot of benefits. There's a lot of good stuff on it. But like a lawyer, I'm going to focus on the bad. What are the risks? What are the, the things we should be worried about about these? Because then we can maybe get the benefits if we're not going to destroy these products by the risks. And, and so there's a, a, obviously when you talk about sensors, the biggest uh, thing that comes immediately to mind is privacy. Uh, because this is tracking things about us our location, our, our other factors, what we're doing, for example. Um, this is a health example, but uh, I was at a conference we did on, on uh, health devices, and uh, uh, some people from Mayo were showing this device where they basically uh, have a thing on your chest that monitors your health. And it uh, connects to your cell phone. It goes directly to your home computer. It goes directly to the Mayo Clinic. And uh, they had used this on their 300, in Mayo Scottsdale, their 300 worst cancer, uh, heart, heart patients that year. And they would have expected between uh, 30 and 50 percent of them died in the first year. And only two of the 300 died because they were monitoring them and catching when something was going bad in the heart much earlier than they would before. And they were then able to intervene and save these people's lives pr proactively. So again, showing the potential benefit of that. But it also has all kinds of other issues. And so uh, they gave their talk, and then I was sitting at the table with them at lunch. 
and they found I'm a lawyer and had all these great questions, like are they liable if, a, if something comes in on the feed that shows maybe something's happening and they miss it because they're all on the golf course. But the one that, that I thought was most interesting is they said, you know, we had this real life situation a couple weeks ago, tell us what we're supposed to do. So the wife of one of their patients calls their line in the middle of the night and say, my husband's on a business trip, he's having a heart attack. And so the, the technician looked at the data and was clearly he was in vigorous activity, but it was not a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And so what is he supposed to tell the wife at 2 a.m., what they think is actually going on? Uh, and what is their duty to have to disclose that? Because they're now finding out what that person's doing at 2 a.m. that they never would have had before. So you, we're getting all this type of data about us, and obviously that's going to be some really private stuff a lot of times. So um, one of the biggest contexts that comes up is in, in, is in the workplace, but also things like parents and children. You know, should you track your children's activity or location, and how fast they're moving? You can now choose to do that with a number of products of, of, of spouses tracking partners and so on. So this is one that um, uh, way back when I started teaching in the late 90s was really hot. Uh, this idea of a, of a hand wash monitor, it's called Hygiene Guard, where basically uh, uh, workers would have a little device that they'd be detected. And when they walked into the restroom, say at a restaurant, if they work in a restaurant, they would detect they're in the restroom and they'd have then a, a certain amount of time, I think it was three minutes, to wash their hands. So they had to you know, go about their business fairly quickly and wash their hands three minutes, otherwise this thing started beeping that they're not washing their hands. They had to stand in front of the sink for a certain amount of time and, and they had to push a soap dispenser uh, and because they don't want people not washing their hands in restrooms. You know, if you've ever been in a restroom you see someone coming out of the stall and, and walking out with a washing their hands, you, know, you hope they're not working in your restaurant, right? Uh, and so this is going to help solve this problem. And there was some initial data that in fact there's a lot cleaner, they did some actual empirical studies and showed that the, the workers uh, who have this have much cleaner hands, a lot less bacteria. Um, but eventually the product was canceled because it turns out the workers were so uh, infuriated by this big brother attitude, they would stand in front of the sink and push the soap thing but not wash their hands, a sort of defiance. And in fact, it, it looked like it was actually washing their hands less, not more, because they're pushing back against this idea they're being forced to do something sort of by this big brother type sin. So, so we have to understand sort of the behavioral implications of all this. But, so we're seeing all these now uses of sensors in various types of contexts. In the workplace, I think, is a major one where there's all these wellness programs. At that same conference I mentioned, there was another one where um, one of the, it wasn't Fitbit, but an early wearable, uh, would have a contest with their customers that you know, whoever uh, walks the most steps a month uh, gets a prize each month. And uh, in this case, the same worker kept on winning, but he had to have his machine uh, replaced every month. They couldn't figure out what's going on until finally he can invest. He's putting it in the dryer all night, every night. <laughs> just going <laughs> round and round and round. And you have other people putting it on their dog or something and get all those steps in and so on. Um, my wife is an in-house counsel of a big company, as I mentioned. Uh, she gets an extra 100 bucks a month if she walks 10,000 steps every single day. Uh, and and it, it, you know, it's not a lot of money to her, but it, 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 that she's frugal, and so it matters to her. And so you know, if it's near the end of the month and she's walked 10,000 uh, steps every day and we come home from something at 11 o'clock at night, she's on the treadmill till midnight, you know, getting those 10,000 <laughs> steps in. So you know, it does have some change in her, her behavior. There's a big study out just last week, I think it was in JAMA or New England Journal of Medicine, showing many of these programs just don't have any real benefit at all. So you know how they're designed might be some of the issues, of, but, but a lot of companies are buying into them. Something like 90% of large companies now have wellness programs. Um, Target gives its Fitbits to all their workers for free. Uh, and now we see life insurers using this. John Hancock's going to start using a wearable uh, for all their life insurance uh, customers to, be, again, track activity, uh, provide incentives for them to exercise and do more things. Um, these are just examples of different uh, insurers and the type of uh, wearable uh, incentive programs they put in place. I think we have one at ASU uh, from United Health. I haven't done it yet, but um, uh, you know it's there now at universities even to, to basically get these kind of benefits. David gave it to pregnant some of our staff got an email. Uh -huh. uh -huh. We know you're pregnant. Will you uh, oh, take one of these and start moving? And do they incentivize them somehow? Yes, them some kind of cheaper premium. Yeah, right. So I was shocked one of our co-supervisors. Right. Wow. Interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's happening even to us. Um, Another one that's really interesting is, is Alzheimer's patients. I was actually talking to one of our students who works, her parents have a, uh, basically a, a will company, a will and trust company. And um, they're constantly getting uh, customers coming in and say, wow. Grandpa has got Alzheimer's or dementia, and he's meeting up with this 20-year-old woman, and she's going to steal our estate. We want to track where he's going. 
you know, and so there's all these people who are now tracking their demented relatives because they're concerned they're going to get scammed uh, by uh, somebody who is going to take their money. On the other hand, it's a real problem, right? I mean, people with Alzheimer's walk, and they like to walk. We have all kinds of uh, problems in Arizona where these old uh, patients are found out dead in the desert. They'll walk out on a 105 degree day and they'll die out there. So you really need to track them, maybe. There's a genuine purpose and there's all these products of jewelry and other things. Uh, that will track where they are, made for Alzheimer's patients. Do you tell them that, they're, that that's what it does or so on? And how do you prevent it being used to basically you know, invade their privacy or their rights to do things? Um, you know, there's all kinds of Alzheimer's patients. Of, uh, I'm in the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law um, uh, that was named after a justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, her husband had Alzheimer's and uh, you know, forgot who she is and fell in love with this other woman in the, in the clinic. And she graciously decided she had to let him go. Uh, just after she stepped down from the Supreme Court to look after him, he, and she's talked about this publicly, so I'm not giving away anything private, but you know, it was this difficult decision that, that you know, he found happiness with this other woman that he wasn't having in his life, and he didn't know who she was even. And so, you know, why shouldn't he be allowed to do that? Um, in the American Law Institute, where we make the restatement of laws, we've had this huge debate the last two years whether an Alzheimer's patient can have consensual sex, even with their spouse. Because there's examples of spouses basically raping a demented uh, uh, partner, and then there's examples that other people brought up and come up, you know, my mother has Alzheimer's, and when my father visits her, this is the best thing ever. You know, they have some intimacy, they have some happiness, like the idea that you're saying it'd be a rape to have sex with her, even though they've been married 40 years. So how do you do that when they're not capable of consent? So there's all these fascinating issues with dementia, but um, part of the solution is to use these devices to sort of track their activity, track their location. Uh, again, parents are doing this with children a lot. There's a lot of discussion. I have teenagers about, you know, what should you do? What should you track? How should you monitor their phone? Um, my daughter <laughs> firmly wants us to track her on her phone. She's 18 at ASU, a freshman. I think a lot of kids aren't like that, maybe. They don't want to be tracked, but she does. You can buy little uh, monitors to put around their ankle, just like, you know, if you are a sex offender, you have to have this thing around your ankle, you can't remove it. But they're putting that on kids now, you know, that sort of looks kind of weird. Um, uh, and then the question is, you know, what happens with this data, you know? Um, so you may be the one who has this product to track your children, to track your uh, demented uh, grandparent or whatever, so you're getting the data, but so are the, the vendors of the products. And what are they doing with the data? And so one of the big controversies is they're often selling it. And often in the consent form, you are giving them the right to sell it or to, to, sell, to give it away to other types of companies. And so this is an uh, interesting article in the Boston Globe last year, uh, basically showing uh, all your location data, who's buying that uh, data, and, and what are they using it for, from your Google or your Fitbit or whatever it is that's tracking your location. Um, it's now being sold through data brokers for all kinds of purposes. Some of which may be genuinely helpful uh, for you or, or just general research, but other ones are kind of creepy, and you may not want your location being uh, sold through these kind of kind of uses. Um, and so this is, they go on to say, you know, and some of it's like research at that, that. It turns out that Netflix users most frequently dine in and out in Chili's, uh, and so these companies want to know who are the people coming into our, our stores. You know, what other products do they buy? What's the correlations between these so we can market better? Um, and again, that's maybe not that offensive, but particularly if it's de-identified data, but on the other hand, if it is tracking where you're going and, and uh, you know, if you're going to an HIV clinic or something and then they're targeting that, that might be, uh, you know, too invasive kind of thing. So again, we, we uh, have these issues of privacy. Um, and then, of course, uh, the, the longer term one is, is a brain monitoring, and of which China is a really a leader of this. I was, uh, at a conference on, on brain monitoring in China in uh, last October of OECD or September, and all these companies in China were showing how they're monitoring the brains of people, which was just absolutely mind-boggling, and they were happy about this. This was a good thing, and they, they, did, they did describe some benefits, but it's also very, at least from a Western perspective, very creepy that they're doing this. And so there you know, some employees, as a driver who's been, has an EEG under his hat that's monitoring his activity, his attention, they have ones on students. There's a 60 Minutes uh, a few months ago on, on students in classes, and the teacher has a monitor, and they can see who's concentrating and who isn't in real time because of the little things on their brain, on their heads. 
and can see who's paying attention and call out a student. You're daydreaming, we can tell it. There's like seven different statuses of which each student brings at. So I mean, that gets kind of really creepy. And yet it could be good for teaching. You know, if you're zoning out, maybe the teacher should call you out, I don't know. Um, and then, you know, uh, this is a, a, a big AI conference in February. Uh, some researchers said that your, your Alexa uh, should uh, detect when there's a crime being conducted in your house and notify the police. And so if they can do that with your Alexa, they can also do it in your Fitbit or your other wearables. So if you're the victim of a crime or committing a crime, maybe they should communicate that to the police and let them know that you're uh, doing these bad things. Uh, things like, uh, you know, uh, collecting when your period is as a woman. Like, I mean, why are they doing that? Uh, and, and, and is that an invasion of your privacy? Um, this is one that uh, um, uh, a sensor detects when a woman is uh, uh, sexually aroused. And so when George Clooney walks in the room, all the bras will automatically unclench. You know, like, why are you doing that? You know, you can do, undo that yourself kind of thing. And then the men's one is uh, the, let you record your, che your penis achievements, a, a little device that your penis is attached and, and taking video of what it's doing. And do you tell your partner about that? So, um, so there's a lot of sort of creepy stuff being sold out there. Um, uh, and then there's a whole microchip, which I understand you're going to have a speaker who's been uh, working on this. Again, you can see potential benefits of that. Uh, this is a story uh, uh, that uh, uh, a year ago that the company all likes it. All the workers like it. They basically get free stuff at the vending machine. They get, you know, they don't have to pull out a car to enter secure areas and so on. Uh, there's convenience to it. Um, and so, and I had a student who had a microchip in his hand a couple years ago, and he used it to open his computer automatically and some other things. And, and there's stories about people in Sweden doing this, quite a few. So some people like these things, to be able to have that convenience. Um, but the problem is, again, who is collecting that data, how they're using it. Um, and so there's all these problems of uh, basically the, the idea of, of uh, uh, discrimination, of privacy, and, and uh, clearly to have this technology be successful, I think we have to manage the privacy issues because that's the obvious thing that comes up as a problem with this. And so how do we do that? And at least in the United States, we don't have very good laws on that. We have both federal and state laws. At the federal level, the main thing we would use for medical devices is HIPAA. And even that has problems because not all medical data is covered. Only medical data going through something called a covered entity is covered. So a lot of medical data, something like 50% of medical data is no longer covered by HIPAA as a result of this technology change. When HIPAA was adopted 15, 20 years ago, it was like 99% was covered. Now we're less than 50% covered of medical data. But there's no coverage of that for non-medical data that's not going through covered entities. The FDA could potentially have a regulatory authority, but they only regulate medical devices again. If it's non-medical, they are hands-off. They don't have jurisdiction. Even something you could argue are, are, are somewhat medical, like wellness and so on, they basically announce a hands-off policy to try to you know, encourage innovation, they're not going to regulate wellness products and wearable products, for example. So we're left with sort of the FTC, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. They have this sort of generic uh, power to, to regulate things that are, uh, to take enforcement action against uh, company practices that are either deceptive or unfair. Uh, deceptive where they basically make a claim or a promise and then don't live up to it. Unfair is a much broader, sort of more amorphous category. But right now the FTC has a total of 40 people doing enforcement of this. So this is our general national privacy enforcer, 40 people for the whole country of everything that companies do that's privacy violations. It's not very much. There's a big proceeding going on in the FTC to see what their future should be. Maybe they'll get more resources. There's bills in Congress to give them more authority and resources. But right now it's not a very effective, although they brought hundreds of cases now on basically various types of um, digital technologies that are either not providing security or not providing privacy. There's a few other statutes that apply, but not very well. So one, in, one area is a, is a workplace, and again, we don't have much protection there. Uh, but there is some, so for example, on wellness programs, there's a question of how much incentive can you offer a company, uh, an employee, because if it, if it is uh, mandatory, it then could come uh, run afoul of some rules. And so we've just been going through two years of litigation on this of, of when companies basically offer an incentive to participate in a wellness program, how big can that incentive be before it then essentially becomes a mandatory program? You can imagine, you know, oh, you're, it's voluntary, but you don't get a paycheck unless you sign into it. <laughs> and, so, um, and so they've had this uh, lawsuit going on that just got resolved. And basically the end product of it is, is as of this uh, January, uh, ADA throughout, I mean, uh, um, CMS throughout their role and are going to have EEOC and they're having to start again. 
because uh, it was held that the, the um, threshold they did put in was too high to really be a truly voluntary program. That it was really uh, compelling workers. You're, you're put such a disadvantage not to participate. You weren't really being given a free choice. And so there's a little bit of law there through the EEC of, of basically employment discrimination, uh, but it's you know not very powerful. And again, a lot of these companies have these programs that are basically unregulated. Most of the action we actually have is at the state level. We have a new California law that's coming into effect next January. It's still up in the air exactly what that's going to require. There is. Uh, new bills and, and regulatory actions going on right now to try to finalize what's actually going to be in this bill that's going to take effect in January and, and some like 12 other states are also uh, doing laws. A few states uh, prohibit mandatory implementation, some prohibit you to track, use devices to track uh, uh, students uh, at public schools or universities and then we have state privacy tort law. So this is where most of our activity is but even those are I think are pretty scattered and pretty weak. And so, you know, as we go through in, in Congress right now, there's all these new bills been introduced on, on privacy. To me, if I'm a company with these type of products, I want to have strong privacy protections because that's going to give people the confidence to be able to use these products and not get creeped out by them. Because if we get more and more of these sort of horror stories popping up in the media of how these are being misused, this is going to be bad for the business. And so it should be, I think, uh, a, a sense of, you know, this is in everybody's interest to have data protection uh, be protected. Except, of course, maybe the, the, the privacy brokers, who this whole business model is based on that. There is other issues beyond privacy uh, of, of security of being hacked. You know, when you're collecting your data and, and devices, and your body could be hacked. There's, you know, concerns about pacemakers. Uh, there's national security. You heard the story of, of soldiers basically out in in, in Afghanistan and sort of uh, confidential sites basically giving away because they're they're um, uh, using these uh, monitors to basically. A track where they're running and you see all of a sudden out in the middle of nowhere in the desert all these people running around the outside of the perimeter of a base and they're giving, obviously <laughs> giving a military base. Um, there's the accuracy problem. Are these actually giving good data? A lot of them are giving wrong data. Uh, there's ones you know to help you plan contraceptives using the rhythm method that turn out to get wrong a lot and then people are getting pregnant because they're, they're not working right. Um, uh, and then there's interesting ones, there's one in Australia, you yeah, don't know yeah. if you were involved in that, but I find it really interesting, I talked to judges about this, because you know, this is a guy who took the, the little chip in a, in a petrol car and he put it in his skin as an implant, oh. and uh, he then got charged and arrested. And there's two different court decisions applying, I think, different ways courts should look at these new technologies. The first one says, it's a technically a violation, it says the rule says you have to have your card. And therefore, since your card has been destroyed and you put the chip inside your hand, therefore you violated the rule and held against them. But the higher level court said, no, we have to think about what the, the purpose of the law is and, and, and be more accommodating as technology changes. So I like that. I like that courts are being more flexible. And so I like that decision as a better one to do. Um, and then, the, then, of course, we have the issue of, of using this in litigation. And so there's two contexts of litigation in the United States where one when the government, the police wants to get access to it, and the other a private litigants. And when the government does, uh, we do have some privacy protection through the Fourth Amendment. Um, but the big loophole of that for digital data has been if it's in, in the control of a third party, there's no protection. So if your data is collected by any other company, uh, you don't have a Fourth Amendment right to protect that. And, uh, and that was... Uh, fine, you know, 30, 40 years ago, but now in the era of digital data where our cell phones, our, our Fitbits, everything's generating data that's being uh, collected by a third party, it's, it's very uh, personal data. We're not intending to give it away to those people. It's just a fact of life that our cell phone is being pinged by every local tower around here. And so the question is, where does this third party doctrine and digital data collide? So it finally came to head last year, in this case of the Carpenter case in the Supreme Court, and we got sort of an unsatisfactory decision. We had a 5-4 split decision, so it's very close. You know, now one of the judges who was in the majority is out of Kennedy, and now we have someone a more conservative in his place. So, but it's hard to predict these privacy issues along ideological spectrum, because we sort of have people on both ends who are more privacy sensitive than people in the middle. Um, so we don't really know what the new court where they are. But even this one was very um, tentative and, and, and not definitive. It said in this case, a third party doctrine doesn't apply. And in this case was where they're using cell tower data to track where this person was over a 45 or 60 day period. And so they said, when it's that continuous, when the government is monitoring where you are everywhere for 45 to 60 days, that becomes so pervasive, it's qualitatively different than just tracking you for a couple hours 
and therefore we're not going to apply the third party doctrine in this case, which has then caused all kinds of headaches for the lower courts to say, well, what about my case? You know, what about if they track me for 20 days? Is that, or if they use some other device, or you know, if they have a smart meter on my house, or all these other technologies? There's still no clarity. So this is still a work in progress, and unfortunately, the Supreme Court failed to give any kind of clear rules there, which is sometimes hard with these technologies. But so in the public context, we have still a lot of uncertainty of these type of devices. In the um, private context, so a lot of people think, well, you know, I'm being sued or I'm suing someone. I have a right of privacy. Once you go to court, you have no right of privacy. It's gone. It doesn't exist in discovery. The issue is, is it relevant and is it unduly prejudicial? That's the factors. There's no such thing as a privacy right. Um, and so you don't, you can't use that as a defense. You instead have to show it's either unduly prejudicial, it's not relevant. Um, and, and the other thing is that these sensor data will sometimes be used by the person. It'll show that I wasn't actually there committing that murder. Uh, and sometimes by the other side. So, um, and so you, know, you don't want to have a one-way rule. And so I don't have time to get into it, but I, there's a couple, I think, really interesting examples where courts have had to do some of this balancing test on whether you get genetic data or whether you get social media data where there isn't bright line rules again. Instead, there's sort of court discretion on whether they're going to allow you access to this data. But this is now being used in all kinds of accident cases to look at your Fitbit data, all kinds of crime. This is a workers' comp case where the woman was able to show she, her, her quality of life has gone down a lot. Uh, for various types of murder and rape cases, as the guy who said his, you know, he and his wife were tied up and his wife was murdered, it turns out he did it. And they used both people's Fitbit to show this. Again, a case in Germany where they used the Apple Watch to, to identify who it was and, and where he was and how the murder was committed. This is a great one where uh, the guy said who was convicted of the crime said the husband uh, forced him, uh, tied him up and forced him and brought him out because he was having an affair with his wife and shot his wife and, and tried to kill him and he escaped. And it turns out they used the husband's Fitbit to show he was sleeping at this time, the steps he took, and the, this guy's Fitbit to show where he was to completely unravel the case and in fact convict the guy who was trying to frame the husband for murdering his wife. And, and the key data was several different pieces of Fitbit data, which is really fascinating. This is one Katina talked about at a, one of our conferences, a fascinating one, of a, and I was at a, judicial conference with a judge in this case uh, was there and came up and talked to me afterwards in Ohio where, where basically, you know, can the police go and get your um, uh, uh, um, you know, the, yeah, the pacemaker data to show, you know, you weren't sound asleep at this time, you're running around doing this. And so, you know, what should be the rules there? And again, this poor judge has to decide what's reasonable in that kind of context. So I'll just close with my favorite law review title of all time. Wearable devices and missile evidence technologies are killing our opportunity to lie. I'm going to try to up more of my time, so. No, you didn't. Uh, I've got to bring you questions for you, but can we have one before we go to Cincinnati uh, for a remote talk? And um, I feel guilty for asking you just one question. It's okay. I know you have a plane to catch too, okay. but a question for Gary. Mm -hmm. How about the Fifth Amendment? Because, you know, if you think about, it is self-incrimination, right? If, if, if war so that's interesting. So, <coughs> so data itself is not right. been held, it's been held not to be subject to the Fifth Amendment, okay. but any kind of testamentary uh, actions. And so there's fascinating case law where um, if the police want to get uh, access to your phone, if uh, they can make you push your fingerprint on there, your biometric, and that doesn't violate the Fifth Amendment. Okay. But if they make you tell them your password, it does. Oh. So all criminals should use a password rather than biometric. No, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Very useful information. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any other question while we're trying to reach Gary? Oh, no, Gary's already on. Excuse me. So thanks to Gary Marchant and uh, yeah. now over to Gary Rutherford who will extend the metaphor uh, in practice of history of human microchipping. Gary, can you hear me? Okay, we can't hear you yet, but just give us one moment. One second, Gary. Okay. Here we are. Perfect. Yes. So Gary, uh, 
you reached out to me in 2009 and the, the action is I was walking back from a lecture where I had just been speaking about you and my, I, I literally could hear the phone ringing in my office, had to put my books down, unlock the door and I pick up the phone and it's like, hi. And I go, hi, it's Katina, I was out of breath. And you go, it's Gary Rutherford. I'm thinking, yeah, yeah. Someone from class <laughs> is pulling my leg. But in actual fact, you said, I said, well, how can I help you? You said, you have to interview me. I said, okay. So we had three three-hour sessions from what I remember and a 54-page transcript back in 2009. So uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and we'll take it from there. <laughs>